So if you um, were at my present, or you came to my poster at AAA, it's the same project. The title's a little bit different because of the um, character count that was allowed for AAA. Um, all right, I'm Kaya Bickford. You probably all know me by now. All right, so my project was the effect of education of preferred listening levels during exercise on attitudes towards noise exposure. All right. So here's my outline. I'll skip that just for time purposes. All right. So um, looking at articles about um, young adults, we know that they're exposing themselves to really, really loud music and other types of leisure noise. Um, in the article by Giles et al., they found that not that many young adults seemed very concerned. They kind of had that attitude where, yeah, it can happen, but it's probably not going to happen to me. So um, we're seeing a lot of that right now. And there's also a lot of articles just talking about the prevalence of hearing loss growing. So what I wanted to look at was how loud people are listening to their music in the gym. And do they know? Like, do they know that this is like, could be a damaging level? Um, so that's why my uh, little meme, if any of you are Lord of the Rings fans, you'll understand that. Um, so a lot of people, leisure noise, um, for them is going to the gym and working out. And you know you barely ever see anyone working out without headphones. Oh, great. great. So what I looked at was, um, I went through a bunch of articles, and I found that it is more dangerous to listen to loud levels of music while you're working out because everything opens up and your ears are more susceptible to hearing damage. Um, and so there were some articles in the past um, where they tried to see if they could cause a temporary threshold shift. So for them, those of you that don't know what that is, it's just a temporary dip in your hearing or decline in your hearing. Obviously, um, you're not allowed to do that anymore, but they did see that they caused um, a bigger temporary threshold shift in those who were listening to loud music while exercising. So exercise facilities are super noisy. A lot of the time, there's machines, even the, everyone next to you, like their feet running on the treadmill, that's loud. And a lot of times, there's background music. And most of the time, it's not exactly your choice of background music. So a lot of people are making their music a lot louder to overcome all of these different aspects. So I wanted to know, does knowledge of noise levels and the risk of hearing damage change after an exerciser? learns about his or her individual levels that they're listening to. So I wanted to know if I go into this gym and I measure how loud people are listening to their music, are they going to be surprised? Like, do they know how loud this is? Um, because a lot of people, you know, like on an, iPad, on an iPhone or anything, it doesn't tell you what level you're listening to. It just shows you a bar. So um, like earlier when someone mentioned their phone telling them that it's a dangerous level, um, most um, pieces of technology that I've seen don't tell you. Um, so a lot of people, I don't think they realize how loud it is. So what I did was, I went into the Allen Center on campus. I had 18 participants, ages 18 to 25, and none of them had noted um, previous diagnosis of hearing loss. Um, some people said they've been told they have hearing loss by like their mom or something, um, but it was definitely not a diagnosis a diagnosis of hearing loss. And um, only 5.5% of these um, participants like reported that they always wear hearing protection. So for the most part, 50% said sometimes, but 44% said never. So just puts things a little bit in perspective. So what I did is I asked them a series of questions and then I measured their personal listing level um, using their headphones. And then I talked to them about it. I had a big noise thermometer where I could tell them about the duration and how it's not only the level that you're listening to, but it also matters for the duration of time. And then I had them fill out another series of questions that was basically the same with two different questions. So this was my lovely mannequin that I wheeled over to the Allen Center. Um, and then I also used another um, sound level meter 
to measure the background noise in the Allen setter, which at no point did the background noise ever exceed 70 dB SPL. So that sounds like, for those of you that don't know, um, in relation to the decibel levels, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like all um, that low because it's 70, but that really is a fairly low level for background music. So just think of that for later, because we'll come back. OK, so my average listening level was 90.5 dB SPL. My median was 89.5. And interestingly enough, I think um, Tim and I ended up with the same um, high level of 104 in our ranges, which is really strange. Um, so my range was 80 dB SPL to 104 dB SPL. So again, does knowledge of noise levels and the risk of hearing damage change after an exerciser learns about his or her individualized listening levels? So I asked everyone to rate how loud they think their music is. So in the green, you're going to see this is before I talked to them and told them about the risks and um, also the duration of time. And the pink plus signs are how loud they rated their music afterward. So you can see quite a few people rated it the exact same. Uh, there was only one person that went from a 7 to a 5. And so there were four people that rated their music higher after uh, we talked about um, everything. So this one, there's not a typo. It is only eight of the 17 participants changed their rating when I asked um, if they think the level that they listen to is dangerous. It was a yes, no, or not sure question, and they wrote in with a pen in between yes and no. So they were excluded from this question. Um, so this graph is just solely showing the change. So there were five people that initially said not sure. They weren't sure if this was a dangerous level. And then after talking and finding out how loud they are listening to their music, they said yes. So that's encouraging. And when it, we went from no to not sure, I'm not really sure about that one. <laughs> that one, I could be a terrible teacher. We're not really sure. Um, but then also, the not sure to no, the person there in between 80 and 85, since 85 is dB, is the level that I said was where damage could start to occur. That does make sense to me, because they weren't sure. And then they looked on the graph, and they weren't at 85 yet. So they went from not sure to no. The person at 90, that one, jury's still out on that one as well. Maybe terrible teacher. We don't know. All right. So I asked them to rate, on a scale of 1 to 10, how concerned they are about protecting their hearing. So before education, it was 6.16. And after education, it was 6.7. Those are the averages. Um, and this kind of relates back to that article by Giles et al. where they found that, for the most part, these young people really weren't that concerned um, overall. So I asked, will the knowledge gained today change your behavior in the future? And I had 14 people say yes, and four say possibly, and I had zero people say no. So that was great. Um, I did have someone say that they would stop listening to their music while they are sleeping which was great, because that's eight hours, mostly, <laughs> of listening to music. And I had another person say, yes, definitely. We only get one set of ears, and going deaf would be a real bummer, you know? <laughs> so that person is definitely changing their behavior. So overall, five participants changed their loudness rating. Eight participants changed their rating of how dangerous they believed their preferred listening levels to be after the education. And six of the participants had listening levels that were not at risk for, um, for hearing damage. So that's another thing that kind of came into factor. If their levels weren't that high, like, you know, had their levels been a lot higher, these six people, their answers would have been completely different. Um, but they weren't, those six people were underneath that 85 um, decibel range. So why I think I got the results that I got. Um, the minimal change in rating could be due to them think, the participants thinking that their um, listening level was initially really, really high and finding out that it isn't that high. Um, and then relating that back to the 
concern, like the little concern found by that other article I was talking about, you know, maybe that's <laughs> people still, they just aren't really as concerned. You know, they have that, that classic millennial feel where, oh, it won't happen, won't happen to me. So that is one reason I think it could have turned out that way. So limitations. I had a low number of participants, um, considering all the people that come into the Allen Center. And I had people take different doors like out of the building I didn't know existed to avoid coming by my booth. And <laughs> so, you know, it was kind of, it would have been great to have more participants. I also think since I used one facility, it would be really nice to compare across facilities or um, <coughs> even just even just the difference of how loud everything is. Because I said it was only, it never exceeded 70 dB SPL for the background noise. So had I been in the strength center here, that's definitely not the case. It's 100% different. The music is way louder. Um, so that would be something to note because then you could take that into account when you um, look at the individual responses from those individuals. Okay, so. I would like to just say thank you to the Allen Center administration and staff um, and all my participants, my capstone advisor, Dr. Veith, and my capstone committee, Dr. Kroll and Dr. Mazzarelli, and we added Dr. King because I needed her help so much. So um, thank you, and my grandma was here today for, among other things, providing me housing while I've been here, and my boyfriend for being a very patient man. <laughs> And here are my references. So does anyone have any questions? None? Oh, man. Yes. Sure. Um, do you think it would matter if you were testing as they were coming in to work out compared to as they were leaving? Um, I think it could. Um, I think maybe it'd even end up being louder, because think if they've been listening to that for so however well, long. If you listen over Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a lot of people, for the most part, they were coming out. Um, but like I said, I really anticipated the background music to be so much louder, um, which is great, like it's not that loud, but it's kind of like, oh, my study, like, <laughs> I expect it to be so loud in here. So it definitely would play, make a difference. Yes? So, yeah, so I asked them questions, and then I gave them education. I talked to them about the duration, um, as well as the level that they're listening to. And then I asked them the same questions, plus like the open-ended question, like how it would change their behavior. Um, I'm not really, that's a good question. I'm not really sure if, you know, because like a lot of other studies, like even p other people have said, you know, it's more about like consistency, like you don't know how long they're really like keeping that in mind. I mean, I would definitely hope that the next time they were in the gym, they were like, oh, this is really loud. Like, I know I had it right here and this was, you know, too loud before. Um, but that would be an interesting, interesting thing to like follow up with them and see if anything was different. Thanks.